Dear Church, let's talk about Bible versions with Dr. Doug Burleson. Hello, and welcome to the Dear Church Podcast. I'm your host, Chris McCurley. I'm so excited about our guest today. I know I say that every week, Doug, but you are one of my favorite people on the planet, and I'm so grateful to have you join us today. I've been wanting to do this for quite some time, and we finally made it happen. So thank you for being here. Hey, it's an honor to be here, Chris. You're one of my favorite people, too. So (laughs) what a great day this is. This is a great day. And so uh, for those who don't know, Dr. Doug Burleson is uh, part of the faculty at uh, Freed Hardeman University. Among the many things that he teaches and does, he coordinates the lectureship there. That's how I got to know you several years ago. And I've been able to uh, uh, now get to see you more often that I live closer. In fact, we had you down here not long ago at Dixon at Walnut Street on a Thursday night. Our elders decided, let's bring Dr. Burleson down, have him talk to us about Bible translations. The reason is because our shepherds wanted to be able to recommend versions to our congregation and let them know what, you know, they felt like were were valid versions or, you know, versions that, uh, you know, maybe you should be studying from or reading from, you know, when we're, when we're here at church. And so you came and did such a great job. And I've been wanting to do that on a podcast for quite some time and we're going to make it happen today. So again, thank you. And before we jump into it, just tell us about life. Tell us about your family. I know you've had a couple of recent baptisms in your own family, which is exciting. Oh, we're, we're blessed. I'm sorry for all the noise that's going off. over here. <laughs> uh, I, I can mute that if I need to, but uh, uh, we have, uh, so I'm married to Christy and we have four children. They range in age from 17 to six. And so we have a full quiver at our house and our oldest son, Canaan, who's just turned 14 was baptized last Monday night. And so we're giving thanks to God for that blessing. And, uh, Christy's a stay at home mom, but she also works as the secretary for the lectureship. And so it's a real blessing that we get to work together in that. Uh, but I've been teaching here at Freed Hardeman for about 13 years and, as you mentioned, direct the lectureship and preach at the Estes Church just down the road. And uh, I'm just blessed, you know, to be surrounded by godly people who are always encouraging and great students. We're looking forward uh, to a great semester. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate so much the job you do. I had an older daughter that went to Freed Hardeman, met her husband there and uh, loved the experience. We didn't know a lot about Freed living in West Texas uh, until we, uh, until our daughter decided that's where she wanted to go. And we could not have asked for a better situation for her. And, and, uh, she speaks highly of you and, and the job that you're doing there. So I, I talked to us a little bit about, so Bible translations, Bible versions, um, you know, let's jump in by, by looking at it this way. So you did a book that, that is out now, and I don't know if you have a copy of the book with you, but you, you can, kind of hold that up and tell us a little bit about it as we go along. Uh, I guess you can find it on Amazon or or send you an email. Is that right? Well, that's right. Uh, the Warren Christian Apologetic Center put this out uh, about six years ago, and uh, it's available through Amazon. It's titled Once Delivered, Forever Established. And I just took a very simple approach, four chapters. Uh, there are some lectures that were associated with it when it first came out, but we just talk about inspiration, Uh, canon, you know, the question of how you got the Bible, transmission of the text, and then everybody's favorite, translations uh, in the last chapter. And uh, it's been useful in ministry. Unfortunately, we're we're almost sold out of these. So we're looking at maybe uh, doing a second edition, which uh, I've been working on. And so uh, we just want people to have a better understanding of what Bible translations are all about. Well, I think it's a fantastic book. I like the practicality of it, the simplicity of it. You divide it into four chapters and you call them like filing cabinets or drawers, the four drawers. Talk about each one of those briefly, if you don't mind. You just mentioned them, but if you don't mind, talk about them briefly. And of course, we're going to focus on the last one, which is translation. Yeah, well, the reason I, I divided it that way, real, really, there's two reasons. One, I was influenced by Norman Geisler and Nix as they wrote a couple of books introducing the Bible several years ago, but I wanted to take it in a little bit of a different direction. And I've just found that people's questions generally fall into one of four categories. Uh, Under the umbrella of um, uh, revelation, they think about, you know, inspiration. How do we know that God breathed the text out? Second Timothy 3, 16, but there's a lot to that. You know, how do I trust that there is a God and that he wants to communicate with me? What are the marks of inspiration as you look at the text of scripture? And then canonization, a canon just refers to a measuring rod or read. And so the idea is, you know, these books have qualities that help us to know they belong in the Bible. 
And since every Easter, National Geographic or somebody seems to discover uh, lost books of the Bible and put out a documentary on that, you know, how do we know that Hebrews belongs in the Bible and that the Shepherd of Hermas does not belong in the Bible? And so canon questions, especially with regard to how silent church history is on how we came to recognize what books belong in the Bible, a lot of questions there. And then transmission, I want to think about my car, which needs one, but we're talking about the text of scripture <laughs> and how uh, it's been faithfully passed down by men and women throughout the centuries, Old and New Testaments. And so these are imperfect people handling the text. How do we know that what we have is what was also in the autographs in that original text that was uh, first delivered? And then, of course, translation. And by the time you get to translation, You've had to already sort of work through several other ideas or drawers that are, you know, indicative of what God's doing in that moment. How do you know it's inspired? How do we know we have those books? How do we know it's been faithfully passed on? And a lot of the differences that we encounter in translations are the result of things that happened with regard to transmission. And unfortunately, that's the part of the story that doesn't get told, but it impacts why translations sometimes vary in the way they do. Yeah. And, and, you know, the big question that seems to always get asked uh, to me, and I'm sure you hear it way more than I do, is, OK, so what's the best translation? Right. And it seems like that there's a lot of myths associated with translations. One of the one of the biggest that I encounter is, you know, uh, the King James Version is like the best. That's the extreme on one end. It's the best version that's ever, you know, still is today because it's the version that Paul carried around, you know, and then you have the other extreme, which is, you know, like the NIV and it's not worth the paper that it's printed on because it's Calvinistic in nature or whatever. And so you have those extremes and everything in between. Both are myths though. And uh, you did a really good job of dispelling those myths when you came and talked to us. But talk a little bit about the myths surrounding translations and this idea that you really can't answer the question, what is the best version? Well, I appreciate that. that that's right. And part of our challenge is you've got the legacy of a, of a translation like the King James, which for 412 years you know, has blessed a lot of people. There'll be a lot of people in heaven, I believe, because they came to understand God's will through that translation. And then you have the NIV and other translations like the King James that continually are revised. Part of our challenge is, you know, when you say King James, which one are you talking about? Okay. Uh, because really most people are not using the 1611, even if they're claiming to use the original King James, they're looking at a 1769 recension, which is basically what everybody's using. Uh, if, they, if they looked at the 1611, it would be much more difficult to read. So part of what I'm crying out for is just this idea that uh, describing translations is a lot not like describing people. We're complex, and a lot of that depends on the situation that we're in, who we are engaging, you know, what we're being asked to do on that occasion. I don't teach graduate classes in one way and then go home and have a family devotional with my six-year-old in the same way. There's a context there, and scripture, especially in versions, you know, may vary depending upon uh, the genre of scripture you're looking at, depending upon the grade reading level that the translators, translators are aiming at. And so I just like to take a verse by verse, sometimes even phrase by phrase approach uh, using a tool like uh, I might talk about Bible Gateway, where you could easily online compare dozens of translations there in the English verse to verse and just see uh, which translation does the best job in this particular verse. Most of them are going to look just alike. And if one stands out as being really different, kind of goes rogue in that particular verse, you know, well, then maybe that's not the one that we would want to, to utilize in that particular context. And so, you know, the best Bible, the old preacher joke is the red Bible, right? The R-E-A-D Bible is the Bible that you spend time with. But a lot of us inherit bias based on what our families do, based on what we've been told about the Greek or the Hebrew. And I would just suggest that we be fair in the way that we look at these and you know, verse by verse, I could give some examples of where I think certain translations are strong or weak, uh, but I'm preaching out of the New American Standard, and the reason is that's the Pew Bible that they used in Baton Rouge when I preached down there for six years. I haven't changed, but that doesn't mean I think it's perfect or necessarily even best uh, in, in a given text. Yeah, I think one thing that you brought to light when you were having the discussion with us is that there is no perfect translation. I think that people have to understand that. 
you know, I think you made the statement and forgive me if I get this wrong, but you made the statement somewhere along the lines of that people like to be able to point to one version and say, this is the best version because they feel like that gives them some, you know, credibility that they know that the Bible they're reading from is the best. And therefore all the others are uh, inferior, but you, you say that's just not the case. That's right. I mean, it's going to vary depending upon uh, the context and the genre. And I, I'm, I'm suggesting what we ought to do uh, is with an air of humility, think about, okay, which is best in this particular context? Uh, think about who I'm trying to serve. When we talk about perfection, I hope that we're talking about the text that was originally delivered, not a particular manuscript or translation or interpretation of a translation. Um, so maybe as we go back to those filing drawers, the first two are really God's activity with regard to breathing out that word and putting in these books uh, clear indications that these are inspired works. So canonicity, you know, what books belong in the Bible are really more God's doing than the doing of human beings. But when we're talking about transmission and translation, I'm not looking to remove God from the equation, but to argue that any human being can get it perfectly right when they're copying scripture or translating scripture just puts a lot more faith in people uh, than, I'll, than I'm willing to do. It's comparable to the idea of restoring the church. You know, God has a perfect plan. How have people, including me, lived that plan out? And so it's not that we're questioning the perfection of scripture. It's just, what are we calling perfect? If I call a translation perfect, someone who's informed with regard to what that original language might read like could take just a few minutes to disprove that claim. And if that's what we're saying is inerrant, I think it's going to uh, hurt our cause rather than help it. No doubt. You know, with the King James, we just have so many more manuscripts. The manuscript evidence is just so overwhelmingly better than when it first came out. And so that alone means it can't be the quote unquote best version. But then with the NIV, uh, I've heard you say that they, they have made revisions to it, that it's, it's on par with any other version as far as its accuracy and things of that nature. I mean, again, not perfect, but that, you know, it solved a lot of the issues or so-called issues that people had with, I think, I think a lot of people were, you know, uh, a lot of Christians, in fact, kind of, you know, downplayed the NIV because it was a little more elementary in its reading and things like that. But I've heard you say that, uh, you know, uh, that, I don't remember how you phrased it, that the King James, while a good version, didn't fall out of heaven in a golden parachute. And then at the same time, the NIV has made the changes necessary to be a valid version as well, or more valid. So talk a little bit about that, if you don't mind. Yeah, a big part of this, I think, is uh, even though we know that these Bible prefaces are not inspired, you can learn a lot by looking at the preface of any translation with regard to who's involved in translating it, what their goals are, what translations were they looking to build on. For example, the 1611 King James, I like going back and talking about the Bishop's Bible and the Coverdale Bible and the Geneva Bible, which are all really forerunners of the King James. And even in the preface to that translation, there's this claim that we're going to continually improve on this. And so, uh, the NIV would be a comparable story. You know, when the TNIV, today's NIV, was put out just a few years ago, there was such a negative backlash to that because of some of the translation decisions that the uh, Global Bible Translation Committee made. Douglas Moo is the chair of that. Uh, he really took a lot of heat for some bad decisions they made. Wayne Grudem, who's the lead translator uh, of the ESV, really attacked what the NIV had done. And as a result of that, there's always a backstory. The NIV corrected uh, many of the things that they were called out on. And so in light of that, the things that we've probably heard said about Psalm 51.5 or other passages that people cite from the NIV, if you go to the one that was put out in 2011, which is what Zondervan's selling, you know, another side note here is that all of these major translations are put out by different publishers and there is a bit of competition Thomas Nelson mm -hmm. with the New King James, Crossway with the ESV, Zondervan with the NIV. I mean, they're all wanting to sell Bibles. And so the NIV said, hey, we got to fix this stuff. And so before we conclude that it's necessarily what we heard in the past, it might be good to go and, and check all of these out and read them comparatively. Uh, I love teaching Greek, but 
You don't have to have Greek or Hebrew to read English translations comparatively. And in doing that, you usually see not only how consistent these translations are, but where one might do something kind of weird. And uh, it's there that we might ask the question, well, why? Why does that translation do this here? And I think that's a helpful step in our personal Bible study. And for those who are preaching, maybe just being aware of what other people are reading is really helpful too. Um, Because we've got a diverse number of translations being used in our congregations every week. There's no doubt. Yeah. You know, Dr. Burleson, there's... uh... It seems like every so often there is this meme that's circulated on Facebook. And to be quite honest with you, it drives me crazy. And uh, it's it's an alarmist type of meme that people share that, you know, Bible translators, like some of those you just mentioned, are purposely leaving out portions of Scripture and therefore can't be trusted. And the Bible, any version you have now is likely not a valid version because they're purposely leaving out. Talk a little bit about that, about the bracketed sections of scripture, what that means and how we don't need to be buying into this this scare tactic. Yeah, you know, I go to Facebook for all my theology and uh, <laughs> I'm afraid that- uh, Of course. <laughs> there, I, think, I think there's probably more of that than there needs to be, but First of all, verse number divisions, chapter divisions, these are not original uh, to the autograph text of Scripture. These are helpful. It would be difficult to imagine asking the congregation to turn to a passage without those uh, helpful tools. But because of that, as discoveries have been made, as we're trying to restore the text of God's intent, as, as it was revealed in the autographs, when that happens, there are sometimes verse numbers assigned that are no longer helpful. I'm thinking about, right. you know, if you had the Mount Rushmore of New Testament textual variations, it would probably include the two longest, Mark 16, 9 through 20, and whether or not that's original to Mark, the story of the adulterous woman in John 7, 53 through 8, 11, Acts 8, 37, the confession of the eunuch, and 1 John 5, 7 and 8, you know, the question of there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. None of those impact doctrine in any way. Those are transmission questions, not inspiration questions, not canon questions. You could do the same thing with John 5, 3, and 4 and the stirring of the pool. Was it an angel? Was it something else? I think the focus of the story ought to be on Jesus. But those memes often will highlight uh, the fact that there are verses missing. And what we're really saying there is not, uh, well, those liberal translators just wanted to rip up the Bible and take out verses. There might be a few of those out there, but they are not the norm. Most of the time, those changes are due to honestly trying to ask, how do those original manuscripts most likely read? And as we're trying to make those decisions and give people an opportunity to examine the text for themselves, you know, they'll frequently include in footnotes the longer version that's included in some of the other translations like the King James or New King James that are built on what's sometimes called the majority text, you know, the way that the majority of manuscripts read. And people look at that and say, well, that ought to be the winner because it's like a football game. The higher the score, the better. But mm-hmm. we're not just looking to count witnesses. We're wanting to weigh them. And we're asking about their date. We're asking about their geographic spread. We're asking about the type of witness it is. So those bracketed texts are not causing us to question the authority of Scripture or how useful it is, or profitable, to borrow Paul's word from 2 Timothy 3.16. It's really just a question of, was it in that original text or not? And those are the decisions that I think are being reflected there. So that that gets into some really, some digging. Um, You know, if if there's not a perfect translation, and if somebody were to ask you what's the best translation and you're saying, well, it kind of depends on what verse or passage you're looking at. So, I mean, this is this is pretty extensive. So what would you say a person should be looking for when they're seeking out a translation to use? Well, let me just say also, I think the easy answer here, I'm not saying it's the best answer, would just be to choose a translation and claim it's the oldest and the best all the time. I could see why that would be really convenient. Uh, But as a restorationist, I don't do that in any other place in my life. You know, I I wouldn't look at the church and say, well, throughout history, what is the majority of people 
What have they done in the name of religion? Well, then clearly that's what's right because God somehow must have providentially preserved that. I just don't find that to be a very helpful way of looking at this question. And if that's the answer, well, then all you would need to do is pick your favorite translation or the one that your your mom or grandma used. And I, I don't mean to be disrespectful in that, but that's got to be the one. Well, really, what I would prefer would be to find a formally equivalent translation as sort of the foundation. So uh, that would be the New King James, the ESV, the New American Standard, uh, New Living Translation. I'm not saying that those are necessarily the best. It may be that your preferred reading material comes out of a, a functionally equivalent, a thought-for-thought -thought translation like the NIV. Choose one text that you're going to focus on, that you're going to study from, if you're in ministry, that you're going to preach and teach from, and then choose two or three others that you can pull in with regularity, because those of us who are preparing five, six, seven lessons a week, you're just not going to be able to always go and dig, you know, at this level. But what that hopefully will do, first of all, it will help you to know, are there any variations here? Are there any places? You know, I want to know if the King James is really different than the New American Standard. I want to be aware of that because I'm going to have people in my classes and listening who are going to ask questions about that. I want them to trust their Bible. I want them to have uh, the proper information there. But then there's also places where there might be a very different rendering. Uh, I've been working recently on uh, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9, where the revised, uh, revised standard version, updated edition, which came out in 2021, uh, uses the phrase male prostitutes in that text. I know that's not the best thing to talk about on a podcast, but uh, <laughs> it's very different than what any other translation does there. And I think it's really off. And it's probably a part of trying to soften uh, what's said in that passage about homosexual behavior. But that's a really serious change. And if somebody's using the New Revised Standard Updated Edition, which uh, the Society of Biblical Literature put out just a couple of years ago, that's something that they're going to want to be aware of. That's a weakness of that particular translation. So I don't want anybody to feel like I've got to be paranoid and look at 400 translations before I say anything. That's not helpful or practical, but maybe choose two or three that are different from one another. And I can be more specific with that, but that helps you to at least know, Hey, there's a variation question here. There's a really different, way that some people are reading this, especially if we're talking about contemporary issues, and just to be aware of that. Uh, if I don't know the answer, I'm going to say I don't know, but the more preparation I can do, the better prepared I hopefully will be to help people who may be struggling with this. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's good stuff. I, I, I've always heard that uh, word for word is better than thought for thought. So if you're going to you know, preach, teach, study, you always want word for word. You might can have a thought for thought over here as kind of a commentary, but you want word for word uh, in your daily Bible study. But even then, you know, we run into some issues, right? Because there's some things that just don't translate word for word from the Greek to the English. Um, I've heard the example, it's raining cats and dogs. You know, there, there's the, the Greeks wouldn't understand that, right? So there's some things that just don't translate. What, what do you think about that? What would be your advice word for word versus thought for thought? Well, a couple of things. One, no one does that consistently. I mean, even translations that claim to be word for word, there are places where the NIV is more word for word than the New King James. It's just yeah. difficult for translators to always be consistent because you're running into figures of speech, euphemisms. You're running into weights and measurements. I'm thinking about when Nicodemus brings spices to uh, prepare Jesus's body in, in John 19 or 20. Uh, how What's described there is that he brings uh, hecaton listros in the Greek, 100 liquid measures. Okay, well, translators have to make a choice there. What's a liquid measure? I mean, nobody really uses that terminology anymore. Well, that is about 75 pounds in our current way of thinking about weights, at least in the United States. So some translations are saying 100 uh, listros or liquid measures. Some are saying 100 pounds. Some are saying 75 pounds. And that is a place where skeptics and critics would go to the text and say, well, see, here's a mistake. Well, it's a translation question. How do I communicate that in English? Am I trying to be word for word, you know, and talk about Saul covering his feet and Adam knowing his wife and readers maybe are 
like, I don't know what that means versus uh, something that my seventh grader can pick up and understand. I used to teach a seventh grade Bible at a, a Christian school in Middle Tennessee. And I remember uh, at that time being required to use the ASV or the KJV. And every time a donkey, you know, was referred to, the kids had a big laugh. And I had to explain, uh, even yeah. though those who maybe grew up on the farm understood that, why there was a cuss word in the Bible. You know, I'm not trying to be <laughs> silly, but it's like, man, if I could have just skipped that whole thing, we could have talked about Jesus a lot more, you know? And so yeah, right. <laughs> uh, translations saying this is always the best isn't necessarily what's best. We we used, uh, when I preached in Baton Rouge, the easy to read Bible in our in our uh, primary Bible classes, and then the contemporary English version, which came out in the mid nineties in our middle school classes, because it's written on a fifth grade reading level. And I'm, you know, we were looking at how accurate is it, but we're also asking, it's not just about how accurate it is, it's how readable in light of that accuracy that text might be and helping people to understand what's being said. I think it's really important. Not everybody's going to have a preacher or some Bible class teacher that's going to come along and help them understand what that means. And so hopefully the text can be as clear as possible. Yeah, it seems like that with this issue, it, it, it's like with a lot of issues in the church, among church people is, you know, um, we determine what is best based on our preference. So whatever I prefer is what is best. And that usually relates to how I grew up, right? You know, uh, the good old days and the way it used to be. And therefore that's best. You know, uh, I think C.S. Lewis calls it chronological snobbery. You know, it's, uh, you know, the culture that I grew up in, the time that I was raised is the best and all the others are inferior. And, you know, so therefore it's kind of the same way with Bible versions. It seems like, you know, this is the one I prefer, therefore it's best. And I think what you've done is just bring to light that, you know, there is no perfect translation. Best is relative based on the text that you're studying at the time. Uh, but I, I want you to correct me if I'm wrong on this. I've always, when people come to me and, and have asked me, you know, what, what translation do you think that I should use or what would you recommend? You know, I obviously, obviously give them several because I think there are several that, that can be used. But I always caution people with study Bibles. Talk a little bit about study Bibles because, you know, obviously I think you can get into some dicey areas with, with those kind of things. Yeah, and that's where we are. I mean, I think as publishers market the Bible, and I know it's hard for some people to think about that, but that's these, these translations have promotional videos and there are campaigns that are gonna uh, convince you that this is the one you need. And you can get the teen version, the military version, the women's version, the men's version, you know, the meat eaters version, whatever kind of study Bible you're looking for. And I think it's difficult, especially in the way sometimes that's arranged, even on our phones, to separate the text from the commentary on the text. And so study Bibles, what I appreciate about study Bibles is the historical context. Generally, that's sort of hard to play with. I mean, you're gonna help people better understand in the introduction to the book or uh, maybe in the footnotes about what a uh, what a farthing is. I mean, you're just you're trying to help people rep, sort of reckon with that historical context or the literary context I mean, I, I would look at every passage in scripture as having three contexts, historical, literary, and theological. And the first yeah. two of those generally are pretty straightforward. Uh, it's the theological part. Um, I remember when we were honoring graduates in Baton Rouge, we always gave them the ESV study Bible, which is a great tool. Um, but we would put a, a bookmark in there or some kind of handwritten thing in there for the seniors and usually put it on pages where we knew that the uh, commentary at the bottom of the page could be misleading. And that's true for the New American Standard Thompson Chain Reference Study Bible, the Schofield King James Study Bible, the NIV Study Bible. I mean, none of these are gonna always get it right. And I know that we've had uh, like the Apologetics Press Study Bible, that's a great tool. But I, yeah. I would always want to help train people to recognize the difference between the text and the commentary on the text. And, and that's, Unfortunately, the world we live in, it's really difficult to actually just buy a text that doesn't have um, all that other stuff attached to it. And so it's like uh, learning to eat meat. You know, you, you take the meat and you spit out the bones and the fat. And uh, you don't have to do that with scripture, but with commentary, that's certainly going to be a part of what, again, not reading with paranoia, but just 
learning to recognize, discern the difference. And I think study Bibles, you know, if I've got a new convert, a lot of that for me is going to depend on how old they are. And uh, I had a couple one time, they they wanted the Bible, they, they couldn't read. I bought them a uh, an NIV Bible uh, on CD. They wouldn't take it because they, they had heard, you know, the King James is the one. Well, I wanted to give them one written on a seventh grade reading level, since most college educated Americans read at that level. That's not an insult, just, you know, the reality. King James is 11th grade reading level. I went ahead and got it for them because I wanted them to hear the text of scripture, but it kind of goes back to what we're talking about with regard to what we've been fed. You know, there've been some people who've sort of made careers out of championing the cause of a particular translation, maybe because they're associated with the school of thought. I just don't, that's not really what I want to be about. I want to talk about Jesus and highlight how these translations can contribute to our understanding of his will and who he is, help us learn to trust the Bible. Yeah, and being intellectually genuine, right? I mean, we want to be thoughtful, and, and, and we certainly don't want to be uh, demeaning or uh, condescending or or uh, even suggest that the Bible that you've been reading from your entire life is the wrong version. Uh, I mean, I, I hope people understand what we're saying here is that, you know, um, there there are some that I'm sure are not worth the paper that they're printed on, and I think those are pretty easy to tell. But uh, you know the, the 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 main Bible versions that most people read from, uh, there are going to be a lot of people in heaven that read from those versions, right? A lot of people have been converted from those versions. And if you are suspicious uh, with regard to a particular translation, I would encourage you to go and compare the translation you prefer to that translation. Pick out the verses that you th- you want to focus on. And I believe what you'll find is that they are a lot alike and that the theological concerns that may have been associated with that translation in the past have now been corrected overall with a few exceptions, like the one I mentioned uh, with the new revised uh, standard updated edition. I don't know how popular that translation is, but if, you know, if you're looking for a reason to take a different view of that issue in first Corinthians six, that translation opens the door for people to claim that's what's happening there. Yeah. So there is some danger there and uh, we certainly want to steer clear uh, of that. Uh, Doug, thank you so much for joining us today. Can you, can you show us the book one more time? Let's, you know, give people an opportunity to, you know, uh, to see that and know that uh, they can, they can pick that up at Amazon. They can email you. And by the way, I want to tell our listeners and viewers that if you uh, have a question uh, about today's episode, you can email me at chris.mccurley at rippleoflight.com. If you'd like a copy of the book and you can't find it, email me about that. Also, if you have a question specifically for Dr. Burleson, I'm sure that he would uh, be happy to answer that for you. I will send it on to him if you want to email me that that question or comment. We just appreciate you so much tuning in today. And, and Doug, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, well, thank you, Chris. It's been an honor. I'm thankful we get to study the Word of God. And I think all the translations options, translation options we have now is actually a healthy thing. It allows us yeah. to read comparatively. And so thanks for letting me have this discussion with you. Absolutely. I appreciate it so much and appreciate you all tuning in. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you sincerely, Chris.